We parked on the north side of the enormous hangar where Dragonfly was mothballed. Everybody took one of the flight cases. Despite my thick layer of sun cream, I could almost feel my skin drying out and cracking. In the distance, the shimmering heat all but hid a small plane on its approach to land. The hangar's main doors, through which Dragonfly left and entered, were closed. We came to a human-sized door. Adrian waved his identity badge at a reader next to it. There was a beep and a metallic clunk. He pulled the door open. It works. He sounded surprised. Of course, said Jenny. Adrian held the door as we filed in. The cavernous interior was pleasantly cool, though I imagined that would change as the day progressed. Light entered from skylights, but not enough to define the vague shapes that hulked in front of us. Somebody flicked switches and powerful electric lights banished the gloom. Nobody spoke until the door swung shut. Still as gorgeous as ever, said Vicky. On a trolley near the front of the hangar, facing the main doors, rested the white form of the Dragonfly Orbiter. Its basic shape was a cone with a rounded tip, 12 feet in diameter and 30 feet long. The bottom was flatter than the sides and top, and was coated in a thick layer of black heat-resistant material for re-entry. People were always surprised to discover the orbiter had no wings or tailplane. They seemed to expect a miniature version of the space shuttle. The ship was a special shape known as a lifting body. During re-entry, the fuselage itself provided lift, or at any rate enough lift to stop the ship from burning up or digging a crater. Wings would have made it much more steerable in the atmosphere, but it was a spacecraft, not an aeroplane. On the way up, wings would have been dead weight, adding to the launch costs. Not for the first time, I wondered if this unusual design was another thing that had prejudiced Dr. Lebowski against us. He'd never said as much, but people in aviation are nervous of anything that doesn't have an excellent safety record stretching back at least a couple of decades. I put down my flight case and wandered into the depths of the hangar. Just behind the orbiter were the first and second stages of the rocket, still mated together. A lump came to my throat as I studied them. My engines. Well, they were a team effort, really. Nothing so ambitious as ever the result of just one person's work. But I'd led the team for five years, and for better or for worse, the company and the media had taken to calling these beasts Dr. Granger's engines. They were white cylinders, the same diameter as the back of the orbiter, with a combined length of about a hundred feet. Their metal was smooth, except for mounting points on the sides of the first stage, where the boosters attached. The stages lay on a long, custom-built trailer. A dozen pairs of jacks lifted the trailer's wheels clear of the ground, preventing it from moving. The whole structure had been here so long that its weight had cracked the concrete. I stretched a knock on the side of the second stage, and a dull thud echoed through the building. Turning to the others, I smiled and announced, See? I told you solid fuel was the way to go. Those who were looking my way nodded. One of the major requirements for Dragonfly had been quick turnaround and launch times. solid fuel rockets could be prepared well in advance, stored indefinitely, and brought to the launch pad at a few hours' notice. All that was nearly impossible with liquid fueled rockets, where the fuel or the oxidizer or both had to be stored at about minus 200 degrees Celsius to keep them liquid. Bill and I went to the far side of the building, where two booster rockets rested, each 40 feet long and 3 feet wide. Sammy's little helpers, Bill said. I raised my hand, pretending I was about to slap him. He'd been fond of pulling my leg about my rockets, saying they were too weak to get into space without his help. He was right, of course, but there are engineering limits to how big a solid fueled rocket can be. The mass we wanted to put into orbit required more thrust than the biggest single rocket can provide, so we had no choice but to use boosters. Jenny called us back to the orbiter. OK, people, she said. It looks like there's nothing but our stuff in this building, so I don't think we'll be disturbed. All the same, we're supposed to be a TV crew, so let's make some effort to look like one. Get the big camera on the tripod and pointing at the orbiter. Get the small camera out, too. Rig up some lights on this side, but don't switch them on. The first time anyone walks in, we can pretend we're still setting up, or we're between takes, or whatever. Is everybody clear about what they're doing? We all nodded. Good. Let's get on with it. I spent the next couple of hours, with David's help, examining the first stage for damage. We knew the rockets had been brought here two years ago, but didn't know where they'd been before that, or how carefully they'd been handled or stored. Can I ask you something, Sam? David said, when we were about halfway through. Sure. He looked sidelong at me and said, when I was in your team, the term you used for flying Dragonfly was always flight, or sometimes mission, if any of the suits were around. But now you always talk about doing a launch. Is there a reason for that? I sighed. Honestly? Now he looked straight at me. It's because I think there's a good chance we won't be coming back. We'd just started on the second stage when Jenny called us together to check on progress. All checks passed on the first stage, I said. 
We should be done with the second stage by lunchtime. Jenny made a note on her clipboard. The heat shield looks good, said Vicky. It hasn't cracked or corroded and it's still securely bonded to the hull. We've checked the outside of the hull, said Peter. There's no damage to the metal and the portholes and their seals are all intact. Good, said Jenny. We've been checking the systems inside the orbiter. Obviously all the batteries were flat. We can only test a few things at a time until they're fully charged, but so far everything's looking good. That just leaves Bill and the boosters. The walkie-talkie on Jenny's belt crackled. Sally Snowden, who was on lookout duty, said, Get busy, everyone. Someone's coming this way and he doesn't look amused. We hurried to the places we'd agreed on for pretending to be a TV crew. Someone flipped a switch and the lights we'd rigged came on all at once. It reminded me of the dummies showing up and my stomach lurched in sympathy. The door opened and someone entered, slow footsteps echoing. What the hell is going on here? Cut! yelled Peter. He turned to face the speaker. I'm sorry, sir. This building's off limits while we're filming. The newcomer, a tall, suntanned man of about forty with slick back hair and a thin moustache, studied Peter as if he was some sort of rodent. A sweat trickled down my back, and not because of the sudden heat from the lights. You've got ten minutes to pack all this crap up and get the hell out of here. Then I'm calling the cops. Thank you for listening to that excerpt of my novel, Escape Velocity. If you'd like to know more or find out where to buy a copy, please visit my website at www.pembers.net. Thanks.